All right, guys, we're ready to get rolling again. We're going to welcome Alan back up to the podium here to discuss bighorn sheep hunting techniques. Thanks, Alan. You guys are lucky you get to hear me for another 30 minutes. Yeah, woohoo. Okay. It is. It's the best. So, I was uh, not originally scheduled to do this talk. Uh, we kind of made that uh, uh, on the fly dis decision about a week and a half ago. So, with all the other stuff um, we had going on, I was given Dennis Gardner's old talk and basically morphed it into mine. So I have to, to thank Dennis Gardner for both providing a whole bunch of cool pictures and for giving me an idea on how to structure my talk and that kind of stuff. So, we we'll fire this one off with a disclaimer. Those that can't draw, teach. So, I have obviously have been applying for a bighorn sheep tag, but I, I drew my first one right out of college, did not harvest a ram, and have been trying to ever since. I've been bitten by the sheep drug, sheep drug, and I am very jealous of every single one of you that has this up here. I want you all to read this. This is, this is uh, from Jack O'Connor, really telling about sheep hunters and their experience. I'm not going to read it because you don't want me to read it. But remember that last statement that he makes. Okay, I think, I think everybody's read that. That is a very eloquent way to look at sheep hunting. And I really like the last statement. There is no halfway on sheep hunting. You can go and hunt a white-tailed deer by spot and stalking, by shooting them out of a, a stand over bait. Sheep you cannot do that with. You have to physically get out there and get after them to hunt a bighorn ram. So, now you guys are sheep hunters. So remember, when you're cold, when you're wet, when you haven't seen a ram in weeks and are ready to quit, there are 42,000 people that will trade you the opportunity that minute of that day. So do all those people proud and realize that you have a unique opportunity here to go sheep hunting because this is a very limited experience and don't waste the tag because you want to go kill an elk. You can kill an elk every year, but this you have a sheep tag. That's very important. Okay, start right off with Alan's rules of sheep hunting. First off, get in the best shape of your life. You have control over how your hunt is going to go. If you go into it halfway, you're not going to enjoy the experience, and there's an, often an opportunity that you're not going to be successful. You can use horses, you can use ATVs, but ultimately at some point during the day on your sheep hunt, you're going to have to climb that hill. Buy new boat boots and a new pack before you buy a new weapon. How many guys bought, got their sheep tag, went out and bought a new weapon? Come on. I know there's, yeah, there's one. I know there's more than one. Everybody's shy. That's the first thing I, first question I get. What should I, what kind of caliber or what should I buy a new bow? Your boots are going to make your hunt. Put your money into your boots. The, the weapon you have will suffice. You're probably better than, with it than you are going to be with a new one. A backpack can save your life. 
If you have a backpack that's comfortable to carry around and can carry the whole animal out in one trip, can mean the difference between leaving half of your stuff on the mountain and getting it out on one trip. My last, my last sheep hunt with my friend, he carried the ram skull, the cape, the back straps. I carried everything else, including his weapon and a sheep skull that I found on the side of the hill. He took his, his camp gear, I took my camp gear. When I got back to the house, I weighed my pack 120 pounds, okay? A little backpack day pack isn't going to do that for you. Get a good, high quality, expensive pack. I don't care what kind it is, there's four brands I recommend, but you can kind of figure out what they are by what are out there, and then get on a forum and figure it out. A cheap pack is gonna hurt you and not gonna get you through that, that experience. Optics are everything. Sheep are not found by walking them up. They're found by putting time in behind the binoculars and seeing them before they see you. Buy the best you can afford. There's a Swarovski raffle that we're gonna do after I'm done with my talk. Everybody could have had a pair, a $3,000 pair of binoculars for 25 bucks. One person could have, not everybody. So, optics are everything. I'm an optics snob. I'll tell you the top three. Leica, Swarovski, and Zeiss. Those are the top three. Not everybody can afford those. Get the best you can afford. It will pay dividends in the long run. You don't have to go lightweight on your optics. I carry these three pounds around with me every day I'm in the field, unless I'm turkey hunting. Every day, three pounds. They're that valuable, they're that effective. I am a much better hunter because I carry a full-size set of binoculars rather than a small pair of birding ones. Get to your glassing point early. I've got a bunch of guys in here that have S9. S9 has 22 tags in it a year, 22 ram tags. 22 guys chasing 50, 60 rams across the landscape. Maybe a few more, maybe a few less. Okay, how smart do you think those sheep are after we've been hunting them like that for 15 years? They know when a twig breaks in the wrong spot that's, that somebody's coming after them, they freak out. Get to your glassing spot before the sun comes up. Just like deer and elk, hike in the dark, hike out of the dark. Get to it, sit there. The first hour of light, you may catch that ram band leaving the alpine, going down into the trees to bed down for the day. Glass till your eyes bleed, and then stay there glassing for another hour. You're not going to walk these sheep up. I'm a sheep nut. I spend hours behind my binoculars. I have been glassing a hillside for hours and had 12 sheep stand up right in the middle of it that I glassed over. They're that hard to see. You will continually miss them no matter how good you are. But you can also see them from two miles away. Spend the time behind your binoculars. It will pay dividends in the end. And this is the most important one of all. This might be your only chance at a sheep ram tag. It might be. We don't know what the future holds. We don't know what changes are coming down the pike. This might be the only one you get. If you don't have pictures, you can't explain the experience and make it meaningful from somebody else. Everybody's got a cell phone. Take pictures of everything. The fire at night, sunrises in the morning, the marmots, the mountain lion you glassed up because you saw it come out of the trees. Take pictures of everything. It, digital cameras, you don't like them, you can delete them later. They're not like film ones, you're not wasting anything. 
Take as many pictures as you can because you won't remember it later on. Okay, scouting techniques. I always start at home. Hopefully you guys have all already started this. Starts at home. Start pouring over the maps. How many guys brought their maps with them today? These are the smart guys right here. Have the biologist draw on a map on your map rather than having to take, take your mental image of his map home with you. Start off with maps. Locate the boundaries of, of the unit, the trailheads that you can use, the trailheads that are used by other recreationists, the trails that you can get horses on, the trails you can get ATVs on. Go through all that stuff. Get on our website, mark down the kill sites, or if you've got a lot of money to spend and a lot less time, buy the hunt data map that's right out there. They come with already pre-populated with the map, with the trailheads. It's a good starting point, and it's a durable map that's not going to fall apart on that first August rainstorm that you get caught in. Google Earth is our friend. It's amazing what you can find on Google Earth. You can pick out trails. You can pick out people. Sometimes you can even see elk and deer. I'm not, I've never seen a sheep on it but I have seen elk and deer and definitely goats. Google Earth is an amazing thing right now. But remember with Google Earth, it is actually a heck of a lot steeper than it looks on the picture. <laughs> and then make your phone calls. Today's a great day. Only half the people that drew the tags come to this every day, every year. That amazes me. You have all the resources that you can ask for in one spot that you can pick everybody's brain from. And only half of you guys, guys chose to show up. So start with your phone calls. It's always best when you're talking to a biologist or an officer, don't say, where would you go, and leave it at that. Show that you've done some work beforehand. The more specific the question, the more specific the answer you're going to get. Don't expect us to give us your honey hole, or our honey hole, which will soon turn to your honey hole and your friend's honey hole and everybody else's. But we will answer the questions that you ask us. Do a little bit of that work that shows that you're serious about this before you make the phone calls. My worst, the worst question you can ask a biologist over the phone is, what are my chances of killing something? I hate that question. That question makes me shut down. One, I don't know who you are from Adam, and I don't know Adam. I don't know your physical ability. I don't know your hunting ability. I don't know anything about you. That's wasted my time, wasted your time by asking that question. So don't ask that question. I always, I always equate scouting trips to dry runs. You're testing your physical abilities. You're testing your equipment. You're evaluating your access. Maybe that trailhead got shut down over the year. Maybe a snow slide went through there. You can only get halfway up before you're looking at, at down trees 20 feet up that you have to go over, around, or under. Things change. And then the last thing I think of, of scouting trips is to actually see sheep. The other three are much better. You want to know if you can set your tent up in the dark before you have to set their tent up in the dark. You have to know how to use your water filtration system. You want to know you have to be able to carry your pack. You have to know, okay, can I make it to this point, to that point? before you have to make it to that point or that point and you're chasing dark. And this one I think is really important that a lot of people get in trouble with. Scout from a long distance if, if possible. Use your optics rather than getting in there amongst them. If you scare those animals out of there, you might not ever find them again. One of my, one of my mentors in the agency had a sheep tag in the Sangres. 
found a, a, a band of 25 rams with three or four sheep that he wanted to shoot in that band of rams. The other guys that were hunting had the same tag, went in, tried to get a, pair of, a set of pictures of them before the season opened up. Ran them out of the basin, he never saw them again. Neither did they. Try not to do that. Obviously, with archery seasons before rifle seasons, that's going to happen. But plan for that with your scouting. If you see sheep, if the hikers scare them off, watch where they go till you can't see where they go. Sheep are habitual animals. They will always go to the same spots all the time. Watch them. They will sometimes go to the same spot and then after a little while, they'll work back into the, into the area. You have to know either where that spot is or know how long it'll take before they come back. So, finding sheep. Glassing properly. We'll get into this a little bit. How many guys pull up, get out of their truck, and go like this? Go back in their truck. There's no elk here. Drive off. Lots. Lots. What to look for? Sheep are very cryptic for three quarters of their body. They're very uncryptic in the back end. They, eat, they each have a very white behind and leggings that go back to the back. Dennis always held up a pair of, of old cotton long johns that nobody even knows what are anymore with a black stripe down the middle of them and said, what is this? It's a sheep. Everybody says dirty long johns. But it's a sheep. The black stripe is the tail, the white butt, and the legs. Look for that. It will show up forever. And then movement. Our, our eyes are adapted to see movement. We're predators. We need to know. That's why we have peripheral vision. We all know that when we're in the woods and a bird flies up way over here, we all see that bird. We do the classic predator response. What was that? You can see movement before you see colors. So always be tuned into that movement. Sheep do move a lot. Sometimes all it takes is that sheep jumping up on a rock for you to see the, the herd of sheep. And then listen. Rocks are rolling all the time on the mountainside. But a herd of sheep going across the mountainside rolls a lot of more rocks than just one rock breaking loose from its spot where it fell and rolled to the next time. If you hear a pattern of rolling rocks, it's probably time to sit down and try to evaluate what that is. It could be a marmot, it could be a hiker, it could be a mule deer, but it might be that group of rams that you've been looking for for days and days and days. And then always, it's best to learn where the sheep are on the landscape. In the first year I had my tag, I was always looking for sheep in the goat habitat. Security cover. The sheep weren't there. Sometimes they were because they'd been scared, but usually they're in different spots. So this is what I'm talking about, the classic, classic pose of a glassing hunter. That's the absolute most ineffective way to glass in the world. Your heart's beating, your head's moving up and down. You're not steady, everybody does it to check something out. But when I wanna see something good and spend some time glassing, I do this. Rest both elbows on your knees, get something behind you to rest your back. When you do that, you create a tripod. Stabilizes your binoculars, lets you get a good, firm look at what that is. You see movement much better than that. What's better than this? Is this. Is this. Swarovski makes a binocular adapter that allows you to attach it to a tri tripod. If you have eight power binoculars, 12 power or 15s like these, or 10s, 8s, 7s, this will allow you to see more things 
than you will see just holding your, your binoculars on your knees. When you can sit there and grid out a, a, a hillside and see a sparrow that is that big flitting from branch to branch through your binoculars, you know you're most likely going to catch that ear flick when a bug gets on it. Super, super effective. Learn from the sheep hunters. If you see a guy standing up like this and then walking on, you know he's not a sheep hunter. You see a guy that's sitting on a rock with his, his arm, knees braced up or on a tripod, he's a sheep hunter or a good deer hunter or a good, or a good elk hunter. <coughs> Can I get my water? Try to plan your day to have the sun at your back if possible. The sun highlights all of the movements and the colors and makes it so much easier for you to see the creatures that you're looking for. The best times to glass are that first two hours of the day, the last two hours of the day with the sun at your back. Obviously, we can't do that every day, but we do try to do that at least for a portion, quartering behind your back. Try to get the sun to your advantage. You will see a whole lot more, more things. So this is another one of those, those white butts and long johns. Okay, we were talking about the long johns being dirty. The dirty is the tail. And then... The back legs actually have a stripe. If you look at this one, he doesn't have very much of a stripe, but if you look at that one, even though he's looking facing the other way, you can tell he's got much more white on his legs. Just like this one. Obviously, white doesn't work as good in the snow. So, big old white patch shows up very well. Those U's, that's a perfect picture. You can see how cryptic the color is, but what's standing out on that hillside is that white behind. Bighorn sheep terrain. My boss and I were stalking 12 rams right there that were in that little patch of, of willows. Slide chutes are a great place to look because they have access to really quick security cover, real good food, and if you look, there's cliff bands right through here. There's a cliff band there. There's actually another cliff band here. When these guys got spooked, they ran all the way around and went onto that spire right there. Three days later, they were right back here again. Looks more like elk security cover, doesn't it? But with that little open spot, with that rack, that little bit of rock right there, that's ram habitat. Use most likely not, unless they're scared, but rams. This is great. Cliffs, cliffs, security trees, security trees, security trees, grass everywhere else. Perfect ram habitat. Same example. If you look at, at a lot of kill shots on sheep, there's always a conifer in the background somewhere. That should give you an in, indication into where they were when they killed it. Perfect sheep habitat. Security cover, cliffs, cliffs, and grass. Grass, grass. Can you see a theme here? This is pretty good habitat. This is not very good habitat for sheep. For goats, you bet. And the sheep might bed right here. But I would bet they're not going to bed through that stuff. But they will be up in here, down in the bottoms, and on these grassy hillsides. If you're hunting a lower elevation sheep herd, like Poudre Canyon, um, Big Thompson Canyon, some of that stuff, 
this is likely what you're going to be looking for for, for sheep habitat. Big, big rock, rock faces, lots of trees, little openings in the, in the middle where they're getting their food. Big security cover. Daytime sheep habitat. You can't really see it, but there's a ram right there. Lots of trees, cliffs, and lo and behold, there's sheep. Does everybody see the, lamb, the ram bedded right there? How many people would think to look for that for a sheep? If you see a ram like that, is that a shooter? And always look carefully. Kind of cryptic, but he's right there. How many sheep do you see on that hill? Pictures are horrible, but it gives you an idea of where are the sheep. Think bigger. One you right here, one you right there, and one you right there. If they're not moving and they're like that, you're not going to see them unless you're really catching air move or tech catch them move their head. Another great one. Sheep right there. But you see when the sun comes out on them, you can see them crazy. Makes a big difference. Another one, you see the two leggings. This one was good because we found a, a, a yearling ram on a, on a rock right here. And I saw the yearling ram on the rock and then got the binoculars up and started looking around and saw these horns. Then this guy stood up right there. The only reason we saw it was because that ram was on that rock. Midday break. Shade is always good if you think about it. These sheep, when we catch them in, in December, you sink your fingers into their hide that deep. And it's so thick, you have to work your fingers into their hide. They've got a lot of hair, a lot of thermal regulation. They're not afraid of being cold. So when the sun's out, the sun's beating on them, they get hot just like a black dog would. They're going to be in the shade. Every ram might be in that shade. One tree. So your, your goal is to look underneath that one tree in that forest. That's why it always pays to be sitting down and with binoculars and looking. Sheep and water. My firm belief is that Alpine sheep don't need ready access to water. They won't, they won't usually go down and, and just drink out of a little seat. There's always little puddles from every one of the, the, the thunderstorms, and they get a lot of their, veg, their water from vegetation. Desert sheep, on the other hand, are different. Probably need to go to some form of accessible water every three or four days. In some of the, the Sonora Desert, they break cactus up to get water out of the cactus. But we don't have that here. So desert sheep do. I'm not going to say that they're not going to use water when they come across it. I'm saying they don't need it. Sheep sign. The best sheep sign in the world is a sheep standing on the mountain. But second best is finding a bedding area. Usually these are on points overlooking a wide expanse where they actively scratch out a pad and a dish. And you can see this ram just scratched it out. And then they'll defecate and urinate in the middle of it. If you watch a ram bed on a big rock, they'll scratch on that rock before they lay down. 
It won't do any good, but they'll still scratch on it to make, before they lay down. In Pueblo, where that great big ram came from, actually we have a series of beds where they've scratched out an area that big just all along the rim rock. And you can just go from bed to bed to bed to bed to bed. Skyline. Best thing ever to find sheep. For some reason, rams and ewes like to get up on those big rocks and look around on the landscape. They like looking down on the little people. Always scan the rims first before you start. Okay, something just happened. You want to advance me? Okay. Yeah, I think my battery's died. Okay, this is obviously the ram. That's the ram that led me to the five other rams the other day. Bedded up on the rock. They will bed on a big rock, flat rock like that, every day of the week. Another big ram skyline. I think uh, Dennis had a, had a thing for flat tops. That's this ram, lived off a C-470, disappeared a whole bunch of years ago. Another U. Okay, so you've found them. What do you do next? The final stock is always where people get in trouble. If I had my choice, I would always come in from above. If you look at these two rams in this picture, you can tell they heard something below them. But they're not looking up. For some reason, sheep don't expect danger that often from above. That being said, you have to watch out for the thermals. If you get above them too soon and the thermals haven't shifted, you're winded. Just like elk hunting, watch out. And one thing I always tell people is when you're on that final stock, don't get rid of your pack. What happens if you scare that sheep up and he only runs 100 yards, and then he only runs 100 yards, and then he only runs a half a mile? Pretty soon you're a mile and a half away from your pack. Usually everybody has all their survival gear, their rain gear, their food, their water, everything in their pack. What good is it doing on the side of the mountain? Keep that stuff with you. Get a comfortable pack. You won't notice it. Wear it with you. The eyes have it. One thing about sheep is when rams bed down or throughout the morning, they're always looking a different direction. Go ahead. If you look at this, one ram's looking this way, one ram's looking that way, one ram's looking that way. That ram's actually looking uphill. Not really uphill, but he could bust you. Another thing is, there's always a leader of the pack. If the, the subdominant sheep sees you, but the dominant sheep doesn't, you might have a couple more minutes to just hide Wait for that guy to say, oh, you know what? He's not scared. I don't have to be scared. On the last sheep hunt I was on, I flushed a small ram. He ran out 167 yards. We stopped. We just laid in the rocks. He bedded down. Hour later, five more rams stood up out of the rocks underneath us that we didn't know were there. He had busted us, but because he was subdominant, he didn't alert all the other ones. They didn't run off. Another one. Always looking downhill. That's okay. Okay? These guys are actually looking uphill. Not saying that it doesn't happen, but it does. And if you're above them, I would always come down on them at an angle. Rather than coming straight down the hill on them, come out at an angle. Because if you come down the hill, you roll run one rock, they're going to hear it. You roll 20 rocks, they're going to start looking up the hill because they heard it three or four times. 
If you're coming at an angle, you can roll a rock here, roll a rock there, roll a rock there. You're more, less likely to, to scare them. Go ahead. Another one. I think some of the reasons why they, they look in different directions, one is predator avoidance, and two is behavioral. If, if, if I stare into Jason's face all day long, he's going to get mad at me after a little bit. Sheep are very territorial, very um, driven by their pecking order. So if a subdominant ram is staring face to face to a dominant ram, pretty soon he's going to get up and go ahead, buddy. So they do it to avoid social strife. And they do it for predator avoidance. Another one, great big ram laying down all calm. His two little buddies are up there looking around. Okay, when you spook sheep, always watch who's in the lead and who's in the back. Most of the time, the larger ram is either going to be in the big, in the very front of that group, or he's going to bring up the back end of that group. Oh, cool. So, another opportunity. Watch where they go, give them a day, half a day, maybe you can get back on them again. Okay, guys, going back to the pictures. Say cheese and celebrate success with respect. Okay, I'm going to pick on the RMBS guys. Two years ago, three years ago, we had a video montage of people shooting sheep. Half of those sheep, it showed that animal rolling down the hill. The little 12-year-old girl that was with me won't go back to that because of that. It was so traumatizing. We all know that happens. We don't show it, okay? Respect the animal first. You can show that to your buddies, but don't let it get out, okay? <coughs> Taking good photos. Clean up the animals. My pet peeve is the tongue hanging out. If you can't take 30 seconds to stuff the tongue back in their mouth and wrap something around it so their mouth's not hanging open so it looks like they're smiling too, you didn't take a good photo. Place it in a natural pose. Tuck the legs up like it's, like it's natural. If you can, drag it so you silhouette the animal and get those, the horns in the skyline rather than blending into the back. Watch out for weapons. How many guys always see a, see a picture where the rifle's pointing right at somebody's belly or it appears like it's pointing at somebody's belly? And make sure you can see the faces. Who is that guy with that great sheet? Do you want that to be your trophy photo forever? I think that's Dennis, so I'm not sure. And then capture emotion. We all are excited. Capture the smiles. Capture the little moments. The little moment when that person first sets his hand on the ram. The tear when he cries. Because trust me, guys, when you, when you kill a great ram, some of you are going to cry. I know when I kill one, I will. My buddy from Tennessee killed a ewe. He cried because his life goal was to kill a bighorn sheep. I've got a photo of that. Okay. Now go out there, throw a pack on, hike or run. Because remember... Okay. Do we have any questions? I know this is uh, about the bighorns, but the water roar and the goats. I think it's the same thing. There's there's a lot of moisture in the vegetation content. I don't think I've ever seen a goat go to water, but there is always water around them, so they can pick a little seep. It doesn't take very much water to for them to get their daily need.
Okay. The question is that two-eyed uh, adapter to this to the uh, the bio, or Swarovski spotting scope. I have not personally tried it. Um, I've listened to several podcasts, and maybe you guys can can say something different. But there's always a trade-off when you go from one eye to another. If you take one objective lens, the light coming in is how you enjoy it, how you evaluate your animal. If you take that, divide it in half, and take it to two eyes, it's not going to be as sharp and as light gathering as it would appear if it was only a one-eyed thing. The benefit was eye fatigue. It's very hard to sit behind a spotting scope for hours and hours and hours and keep one eye closed while you're staring through your dominant eye. If you have both eyes open, it's a whole lot easier, but I have not used it myself. To us. Okay, he's asking about the, the attachment um, to put a camera on, on a spotting scope, correctly? I have used one, it's awesome. Um, it's a whole lot easier just to clip that on there and slide it over your objective lens, uh, or actually your eyepiece of the thing, and take your pictures that way rather than hold it up there and try to figure out where it is to get, take a picture. It's like using a uh, telephoto lens on a different camera. Works very well. One more. You know, I, I car I've carried the same pack for, since, not, since I bought it at an RMBS banquet in 85. Um, I put a di couple different, different frames in it, but I carry a 7200 cubic inch pack every day, whether I'm hiking the mountains to, to train or if I'm going sheep hunting. The reason is, I don't want to make another trip back to get a bigger pack to carry the animal out. I want to be able to take everything with me. Um, with the new packs they have nowadays, they can be scrunched up with, with straps, so it, it pulls everything tightly together to your back, so it works like a day pack. It's a great, great, great feature. The packs today are amazing. Okay, one other thing I always forget. If you guys want to hike for a long time and do it for a lifetime, get yourself a set of trekking poles. I know everybody has the appearance that these are sissy poles, that they're only for backpackers, that kind of stuff. These things will make the biggest difference in your hunting and hiking career of any tool that you can get. You can climb 25% faster and 25% longer just by using one of these these sets of poles. Throw 50, 60, 70, 100 pounds of weight, it's a whole lot safer having four points of contact climbing down out of the sheep woods when, than if you just did it with your feet. These things make the biggest difference ever. Um, one, of, one of the guys that works for us used them in Alaska, they took them apart. This piece obviously is hollow, he would stick it between the rocks to get to a seep, suck the water out of it, out of a seep that you couldn't dig down to and get water through the trekking poles. I always carry duct tape on them just because everybody needs duct tape, no matter what. Universal tool. Anything else? One more. Uh, Kafaru first, Stone Glacier, uh, Exo, Mystery Ranch is a good one. I'm a Kafaru pack guy. You guys asked the question. I didn't recommend it. Are we good? Okay, guys. Last thing. We hope this has been beneficial completely. Um, have a great hunt, and success does not matter. The size does not matter as long as you are happy with it. Go shoot a great ram and make me proud, and make everybody that get, didn't get that tag proud. <laughs>